Hey everyone, um, everybody's having a good uh, session so far. Uh, we are now at um, chapter six and we're at the last half of the book. And uh, so I hope that so far you've gained a lot of information that you find to be interesting and beneficial, uh, particularly about understanding one, how the American system works, some of the problems and issues with it. Um, I'm sure you've been shocked by some of the things that you've actually had to see. and. Uh, Actually, I think that's a good thing. I think uh, it's necessary sometimes to challenge yourself to, to get uncomfortable with information that comes your way or may even challenge uh, what you were taught or what you were brought to believe by your families or, or friends even. Um, but this is part of the growing process as you start to develop a mindset of your own about uh, about the world around you and your and how you interact with it and the decisions that you have to make by voting, uh, you start to realize that you're actually more important than sometimes you might even think you are. So uh, chapter six um, is a chapter about the judiciary. Uh, so we'll learn about the court systems and how they operate and what they do. And uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, going through this with you and sharing with you some of the nuances of the court system. So without further ado, uh, let's get to it. Okay, so um, as we begin to look at this chapter, uh, and again, as you're sure you already understand that the, of the three branches of government, this is the branch that interprets law. Their job is not to make law. That is a part job of Congress. But the judiciary branch, the judicial branch, if you would, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Supreme Court and the lower federal courts and even the courts below the federal courts, um, they're tasked with interpreting laws and the constitutional laws and to determine whether they make sense or whether they are, how they're going to be applied given the circumstance. <laughs> All of a sudden, every plane decides to fly overhead. Um, okay, so let's get into this. So, uh, when we talk about the judicial branch, of course, you know, the early part of the founding of our country um, after the Constitution was cre created, uh, it was really just basically a, a uh, order of the judiciary to sort of deal with all the various disputes between citizens and between themselves or between the citizens and the government. Uh, this is the mechanism by which they were able to basically provide the infrastructure so that we wouldn't have chaos and anarchy uh, by having laws and having a, an interpretation of laws by judges uh, to be able to determine these things. Um, Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton called it the least dangerous branch, probably because their, their job is to interpret, um, even though I would argue that that in the modern context that he may have changed his mind about what we determine it to be the least dangerous branch, partially because they have the ability to overturn laws like, for example, Roe versus Wade, the woman's right to choose regarding the abortion issue. I'm not asking you to say how you feel about it, but imagine having a situation where the Supreme Court gets to make the final decision on these issues. And all of a sudden, it's just uh, been left uh, there. And once they make a decision, it's done. So it really is uh, pivotal to understand how powerful, potentially, when they interpret a case, because the case becomes the norm of society. Um, the power of the court uh, was enhanced in 1803 under the case of Marbury versus Madison. And this real, the, the purpose of this, what made it so important, was that it actually accorded more power to, to, the, to the judicial branch of government to be able to review cases uh, and to interpret law. So uh, it's one of the founding uh, cases that allowed for the Supreme Court to actually have you know, uh, more power in its possession. Um, when we talk about the context of rule of law, of course, as you see there on the page, on the PowerPoint, uh, it's just the idea of how the laws are applied and to make sure they're applied. They're supposed to be, at least in concept, applied equally to everyone, um, everywhere, and not to be unjustly applied, even though we already know that that's not the case, that uh, the laws are certainly subject to question, and even though it's interesting when you see pictures of Lady Justice, she's always blindfolded, 
And I'm always like, yeah, she's not that blind because usually she's peeking through with one eye, right? Um, and so we have to be very careful about how we, the process of how we utilize the rule of law and also recognizing the appeal process that even if a case is decided a certain way, there is a mechanism to appeal, you know, all the way up to the Supreme Court if need, if need be. Um, even though that's a very difficult process, but we'll talk about that later. Okay. Um, there are certainly different types of law, and even listed here on the on the page of the PowerPoint, where you see all the various iterations of law. Of course, the ones that are most powerful, the ones you hear about most commonly, are criminal law, civil law. Those are usually the two you hear about the most. Uh, however, I was to say there are other types of law. There's containment law. There's very specialized fields within law outside of even the ones you see here. These are more of the umbrella for multiple specialized fields of law that exist. But again, as I say, criminal and, and civil law are the two primary drivers of what we see in our system that most of you would be aware of. Uh, even though, again, some of these, uh, again, as you start to grow and develop your understanding of them, uh, you'll begin to see how they all apply. But uh, all of them are necessary because the legal field has broadened so tremendously over the last 200 plus years that we have to be able to apply various laws in certain types of special cases in certain ways. So um, it's a very in, uh, in-depth, uh, entrenched system and organization of laws and policies that are put in place uh, through all the various iterations of law. Now, um, when we talk about the various traditions in law, uh, we have common law versus civil law tradition. And you can see there, the common law tradition basically means that the judges basically decide uh, on cases based on the, the traditions and precedents of the, of, the, of the laws that have been in place. So if, if you get, get into trouble for a particular reason, they go back and they would look at well, how the law had been applied historically and then apply it. Uh, to the decision that they're about to make. And then the civil law, as you can see, uh, tradition has a lot to do more with the legislature and the laws that are passed by Congress or even state legislatures. Uh, and so these are, the difference between these and common law is that these are, once these are written by legislature, meaning their bill has become a law, the judges only have certain parameters that they can decide in terms of their judgment on the case. Uh, so that's what makes it different. As the other one, common law is really about sort of the precedents that have been set uh, by law. Uh, and as you can see, there are other types of law. There are adversarial systems and inquisitorial systems and litigious systems. There's various iterations of different types of legal systems. I don't expect you to become the expert on law on this, but I just wanted to give you some idea of the various types of law in case you were considering being an attorney. It's more than about being a criminal or civil law attorney. Okay. Um, so this is again just to give you just a visual of this. So you see the historically uh, when looking at the different types of system, they, here they're looking at the adversarial, the inquisitorial, and the authoritarian systems of law. And they of course lay out the role of the judge, the role of the lawyers, and the goal of the proceedings. Uh, and they give you some key examples of uh, different types of iterations of this under certain political situations. So, for example, if you're looking at the adversarial system, uh, the judge plays a very neutral role, so he hears the case. Uh, the, lawyer, the, the lawyers themselves basically advocate for each side based on their skill and abilities. Uh, the, process, the dual process is the meaning that they go through the procedures, and he, both sides are treated equally under the eyes of the law. So this is all part of the process. This is what's example of the, in the U.S. system. And you can see, of course, in the inquisitorial system in France, you can see how they do their thing. And, of course, authoritarian systems, they use Nazi Germany during the time of Hitler. You can uh, see the, how the role plays out. So the various different uh, countries may apply or conduct law in a very different way uh, than the United States does. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, so judges, you know, certainly have certain rules to play, whether you're looking at criminal court or civil court. Uh, judges have to play certain types of roles in both iterations. So um, 
like it says here in trials of juries, the jury is the decider of what is factually true. The judge basically decides how the law is going to be applied and what the sentence is going to be based on the facts that are presented to the jury. Um, and then in civil court, the judges also impose, okay, well, the judges also impose sentences, although in some state courts, juries do so when the death penalty is involved. Uh, and again, that's to take the onus off the judge um, in case of death penalty. Um, one of the things that we have to confront, of course, because of the lack of, of or should be because of inequality within the framework of the court system, are things like racial profiling. And this is really a big problem in our system, which is one of the reasons we have so much protest today, is that certain groups of people are, are profiled, and this is why you have higher incidence of arrest and harassment of certain groups of people, particularly black men. But not just black men. I mean, you could go down the road if you're in the Southwest. You'd be looking at Hispanics as well, and uh, you know, so there's some other areas. Be you know, the LGBTQ community might also be uh, profiled. So it's really, uh, you know, this is when people or people or the, the authorities, the police are biased toward a particular group, and they're looking profiling them for as possible uh, criminals or suspects. Um, so in the United States, we have what's called a dual court system. Um, yes, it is uh, complicated because it, even though it is, we do have laws that are written. Most of them are written in such a way where well, when you read them in the Constitution, it's beautiful. The interpretation of law is what's complicated. So you'll find lots of situations where how the law is written versus the interpretation by an individual is what causes for confusion. Um, it's the beauty of the law on one hand because it's flexible, but it's also the problem in that it tends to create more complication in the process because of the interpretation. And of course, you have some attorneys that are very good at interpreting it and, and are able to support their their defendants, and there are some who are not, and sometimes their defendants you know, get hit real hard. So it really does depend. Okay, another plane went by. <laughs> So, when we, uh, this, the construct of the court system uh, under Article 3, Section 1 of the Constitution lays out uh, that the structure of the hierarchy of the, of the court system, starting with the Supreme Court, that there would be one Supreme Court, and then there would be a series of lower courts that would be established by Congress. These would be the federal courts and the courts that are set up below the federal level. Um, and then the judges of the federal courts, which are also selected at the highest level of government. So this is the basic construct that the Constitution outlines for, uh, for the, the hierarchical structure or institutional structure of the court. So when we see the dual court system, we're really discussing that context of the federal court and the state court system. And you can see here on the, on the, on the uh, illustration that at the federal level, meaning the national level, we have a Supreme Court of the United States of America, then we have the Court of Appeals, and there are 12 of those across the nation, and then we have the district courts, and there are 94 uh, district courts with approximately 674 judges, or sometimes we'll call them judgeships within that district court system. Now, at the state court level, um, we have a state Supreme Court, um, and then we have below there the state intermediate court, or sometimes called the appellate court. And then below that, we have the trial courts. And in, under the trial courts, there are multiple different courts. Here we go again. So when you're looking at the trial courts, you're really, you know, they're talking about superior local courts, superior court, probate court, uh, county court, or municipal courts, and things like that. Uh, these are all done at, the, at the, basically the lowest level of the state court system. And uh, this is basically the structure of our, of our dual court system. Now, if you were to have a case, and probably when you watch the video, uh, Class Apart, uh, which deals with the first Hispanic case brought to the Supreme Court, they took their case from Texas, and they went to the Texas Supreme Court, and they lost their case. So then they had to appeal the case to, to, the, to the federal, at the federal level, uh, to the state, to the federal uh, Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court. And so, but you have to go through the mechanism of 
of the dual court system in order to get to the Supreme Court, if you're going to get there. Uh, this just breaks down the, the system, how the, how, the, how the courts are broke down or broken down. Um, you know, this is one of the most contentious parts of the court system, particularly the Supreme Court, is that the, the founders initially wanted to, you know, had notions that the judges would be, or the justices, if you would, would be, would have lifetime terms, this is at the Supreme Court level, and that by doing so, they would be above politics and above any of the political mess or minutia <laughs> uh, that existed. So by having lifetime term, they thought that would be a valuable commodity. However, I would disagree with it completely because <laughs> the, unfortunately, the justices are nominated by the president, um, who was obviously very political, and they had to be approved by Congress, by the Senate, and they are also <laughs> Uh, incredibly biased in their own opinions. So, therefore, you're asking them to be above the politics, but they are selected and brought on because of the politics. So it's sort of very hypocritical, if you would, to consider that the Supreme Court justices, uh, that you would give a lifetime term to those folks who potentially, or everyone carries some sort of bias, but in that, why would you give them a lifetime term in the process? Um, but nonetheless, this is the process. This is how we got to be uh, where we are today. Now, in terms of getting a case heard by the Supreme Court, um, that's a very interesting process. And let me see. There's, there is not a graph that I can show you, but I'm going to pull up one. So hang on one second. Okay. <laughs> I dug it up quickly and, and put it up here for you. So I wanted to show you the process of how uh, the Supreme Court hears a case. And if you look here at the bottom, it starts from the bottom and works its way up. So you have a final judgment. This is the state. This is how it gets there if you're going through the states. This is how it go, happens if you go through the federal system. Uh, so if you're at the state Supreme Court and say your court, your case gets, say your case doesn't turn out the way you want, and you file an appeal, uh, the appeal is called a writ of sturdy orari. There it is right here. A real funny name, Writ of Sturdy Arari. Uh, and basically, this is basically a writ that says, this is why I want my case heard by the Supreme Court. And so, so if, again, um, if you look at the, the federal level, you see that basically a judgment would have been rendered in the U.S. Court of Appeals. And also, the process is the same. You have to file a writ or a petition in order to have your case possibly heard by the U.S. Supreme Court. Again, it's still the same writ of Surya Rari you have to petition. But what's most important is look at this over here, how many times these petitions are denied. 97% of the petitions that are, when people are trying to have their case heard at the highest level, are kicked back to a lower court. So that means only 3% of the total cases that are presented uh, for to uh, be heard by the Supreme Court are actually heard by the Supreme Court, 3%, that's it. So you can see how uh, how challenging it is to actually get to that high, that level to have your case heard. Um, after that, when, if the petition is approved, uh, whether you're at the federal level or the state level, you file basically a brief. Um, and the brief basically outlines your case. You're basically writing down and presenting to the Supreme Court for them to review the issues surrounding your case and why you think your, your case should be heard from that level and basically making your argument. And uh, at that point, once you've done that, then you get to present your oral arguments to the court. And this is a big deal uh, to get in front of the justices and be able to support your case. Boy, it is a busy day for flying here. <laughs> in any event, so once you present your oral arguments, then the justices will basically get together, have a conversation about what they think about uh, what you've written, what you've submitted, and your oral, oral arguments, and then they will make a final judgment. Um, out of that final judgment, uh, there will be a majority opinion, which means of the nine justices, and there are always nine of them, um, 
that uh, you have four, you'll have eight justices and one chief justice. Right now, the chief justice is John Roberts, and he is a conservative. And uh, usually if there is a, let's say if, there, if the eight justices had come to a tie on a case, the chief justice is the one who makes the final decision. Uh, and that's typically how it works. Uh, but you'll have the majority opinion, meaning the, whoever the, you know, the, the five or more justices, you'll have their opinion on the case. You'll have the concurring opinions, those that supported one side of the case that supported the outcome. And then you'll have, for those who did not agree, the justices who did not agree with the case or the outcome, they get the right to write a dissenting opinion on why they felt that uh, their side of the argument, which they may have lost, was still important. And those are the three primary outcomes that uh, come out of the Supreme Court when they make a decision. Of course, by doing so, like things like Roe versus Wade or even dealing with the national health care issue, uh, you know, this, these are things that uh, push the court in very different directions, and it can be very complicated. Sometimes the court will just make decisions based on, you know, the political pressure that's going on at the time. There are lots of different reasons why the court may decide what they decide. Um, I'm not a big fan of lifetime terms, as I mentioned earlier. I think it's very dangerous precedent to have a lifetime term for anyone. But, uh, you know, if we ever want to change that, we should really consider it because they're definitely not above the law. And uh, they also have bias, as I said earlier. So it's important for us to recognize that. Um, and then last but not least, um, just some terms here that, you again, I want you to know. Uh, of course, I mentioned already the writ of certiorari here. Uh, the amicus brief, uh, which is, again, what you file to be able to uh, to decide whether they're going to grant this, or the writ of certiorari. Again, I've talked about the majority concurring and dissenting opinions. Uh, as far as the... the uh, the how justices sort of view the Constitution. This is the last thing I want to share with you. There are those that are called judicial interpretists, and the, ju and the judicial interpretivists, these people are the ones who look at the Constitution as a living, breathing document, and that judges, the judges should be able to interpret it through whatever lens or odd time they're looking at. So they're looking at year 2020, they should be able to take the Constitution and apply it in, you know, in context of the time we live in. And I'm almost done, so I'm going to talk right past the airplane. Uh, the other side is what we call the strict constructionists. And these are people who think the Constitution should be held in its literal time and place. So uh, basically the, that the framers' idea uh, should, be, should not be messed with, that uh, you know, whatever they did in 1791 should be the rule of the day. Uh, that's a real problem for some people because we don't live in 1791 and the idea of how the laws are applied is very different today than they were 200 and some odd years ago, right? Okay, so now that we have finished with the Supreme Court, I look forward to seeing you in Chapter 7. Okay. Let's have a great day.